Secrets of the Iberian Peninsula starts with an Emirates flight into the Portuguese capital of Lisbon. We have three nights here. We then take a three hour coach journey to Porto. We also have three nights. During the time here, we explore the historic towns of Braga and Guimarães. And on the last day, we venture into the beautiful Douro Valley. Lying on the Atlantic Ocean, at the mouth of the Tagus River, Lisbon's relationship with the sea is symbiotic. It is reflected by this beautiful monument to the explorers. Here we see Vasco de Gama, Ferdinand Magellan, and Henry the Navigator, and many more. From the top of this megalith, we look down upon the map, which charts the routes and discoveries of Portugal's intrepid mariners. All of these great seafarers would pass by the 500-year-old Belém Tower. It is a fortress which guards the entrance to Lisbon's harbour. Founded 3,000 years ago, Lisbon predates London, Paris and Rome by centuries. Starting as a Phoenician outpost, it expanded into a 16th century trading giant. And then came the great earthquake of 1755. Lasting for an astonishing six minutes, it was followed by a tsunami and a five day firestorm which obliterated 85% of the city. Reconstruction began swiftly and within a year, Wide boulevards replaced the Medina rabbit warrens of old. A new style of elegant, earthquake-resistant architecture began to emerge. This is Rocio Square, heart of the city, and 200 metres from our hotel. Since the Middle Ages, it has been the place where people have gathered for bullfighting and celebrations. Yet the earthquake has never been forgotten and the ruins of the Gothic Cathedral of Carmor in Baixa district is a poignant reminder. The roof collapsed during a mass service and hundreds of people were killed. It is a powerful and eerie symbol. Behind the cathedral is the ancient and delightful neighbourhood of Alfama. Spared during the earthquake, it retains a village atmosphere and for centuries it's been the home of writers and fado music. Lisbon belongs to that club of great cities that are defined by seven hills, and the iconic trams have been rattling between their slopes since 1900. In the 14th century, the southwestern corner of the Iberian Peninsula was considered the end of the world. 21st century Lisbon feels like the beginning. Good fast roads take us to Portugal's northern city in three hours. If Lisbon is beautiful, Porto is magical. Dissected by the Douro River, Porto's most iconic landmark is the Dom Luis I Bridge, built in 1866 and designed by Gustav Eiffel. During our three nights in Porto, we stay at an astonishing UNESCO hotel and is constructed from 18 riverside mansions. It's luxurious and all rooms have views to the bridge and the river. Walking in Porto is a winding confusion of medieval cobbled streets. It is an atmospheric city of faded glory. It is a trip back in time to Charles Dickens' London town. Porto is home to the Lelo Bookshop, 
probably the most beautiful in the world. This was the place that inspired J.K. Rowling to create Harry Potter, and it's easy to see how this eclectic gothic masterpiece with wonderful literary spaces could have evoked such legendary caricatures. This is the Sal Bento railway station, where we depart for the Douro Valley. Once a Benediction monastery, this station is an outstanding example of Portuguese art of azulejos. 20,000 ceramic tiles placed over an 11-year period depict Portugal's past, its royalty, its wars and its transportation history. The journey from Sao Bento Station to Hagua in the heart of the Douro Valley will take two hours. We will skirt the Douro River throughout. When we arrive at Hagua, we transfer to our ship for the eight hour journey through this magnificent valley to return to Porto. The spectacular landscape is characterized by improbably steep terraces covered in vines that produce port. We will pass through two locks on the way back to Porto, both with breathtaking heights. By early evening, we start to see the first of six bridges that span the Douro. They signal our stunning arrival into Porto, where we will dock just outside our hotel. The next stage of the journey begins with a five hour drive to Salamanca, where we have one night. The tour then arrives in Madrid for a four-night stay where we also visit the nearby towns of Toledo and Aranjuez. We leave Porto and cross the border into Spain. By lunchtime, we arrive in Salamanca. The whole of the UNESCO Historic Centre is made of warm sandstone and as the sun sets, red hues turn the town into gold. Because of its intricately carved facade, the university, the third oldest in the world, is considered one of the most beautiful. The Casa de las Conchas is also a masterpiece of Gothic and Renaissance architecture. Decorated with 300 shells, it is now a public library that attracts everyone that visits Salamanca. Plaza Mayor is the bustling heart of the town and one of the largest in Spain. Without doubt, the plaza is one of the most beautiful in the country and its Baroque architecture and intricate decorations are dazzling. We have dinner on the square and soak up the student and Spanish atmosphere. Good fast roads take us into the Spanish capital in just three hours and as soon as we arrive, we explore the Lung of Madrid, the Tiro Park. This is the most famous green space in Madrid, 1.3 square kilometers in the heart of the city. The magnificent centerpiece of the park is the stunning Palacio de Cristal, a conservatory which was constructed in 1867. It is made entirely of metal and glass. After a relaxing lunch in the park, we head to the main square of the city, Plaza Mayor, 
This historic plaza is just three minutes walk from our hotel. This 15th century public space is situated in the charming old town of Madrid. Its history is immense and it used to be used for bullfighting and executions by burning at the stake as well as hangings. The next day we visit the Royal Palace. Although the Royal Family no longer live here, it is still used for state ceremonies. With 3,000 rooms, it is one of the largest palaces in the world. One of the most exciting experiences in Madrid is a visit to Mercado de San Miguel. Far more than just a covered market, this is a place where people socialise. And it's a tapas hall, a beer hall, and it serves food from all over Spain. It is a Madrid institution in itself. Toledo, only one hour from Madrid. It's an exciting day trip. Surrounded on three sides by a bend in the Tagus River, Toledo sits spectacularly on a hill. The town is a repository of 2,000 years of historical coexistence between Arabs, Christians and Jews. In fact, they didn't just coexist, they thrived together. Because of this, Toledo possesses a wealth of medieval Arab, Jewish and Christian monuments. Many writers, musicians, artists drew inspiration from Toledo including El Greco, painter and architect of the Spanish Renaissance. On our last day in Madrid, we take another great day trip outside the capital. It will take us 50 minutes to reach the Palace of Aranjuez. This palace is still used by the Spanish royal family in much the same way that Balmoral is used by the English monarchy. What makes Aranjuez so special, however, is four distinct gardens which range from enchanting green forests and parks with elaborate fountains and statues. The tour now heads south and we take a two hour bullet train to Cordoba where we have enough time to see the magnificent Mesquita before connecting to Sevilla with a 45 minute train. We stay in the birthplace of flamenco for three nights and then a three hour coach journey whisks us into Granada for two nights. Our hotel is an easy 15 minutes walking distance from another of Madrid's great buildings Atocha Rail Station. A luggage car will transport our suitcases to Sevilla and this makes for a hassle-free train journey. We arrive in Cordoba Centre by mid-morning. This great city was founded in 169 BC. Perhaps no other place in the world represents the collision of Islam and Christianity in quite the same way that Cordoba does. One of Europe's greatest treasures lies across this Roman bridge. Founded in 1774, the Mekita represents the finest work of Muslim architecture in Europe. When Christians reconquered the Iberian Peninsula in 1236, the Mekita was used as a church and remained unaltered for 300 years. This took 250 years to complete. It was then decided to build the cathedral right in the centre of the mosque. The beauty and scale of the Makita Cathedral is impossible to exaggerate. A short train ride brings us to Sevilla by early evening. The capital of Andalusia 
is a rose-tinted jewel of religious and civil architecture. It has an atmosphere unlike anywhere else in Spain. When we arrive at our hotel, in the very heart of Sevilla, we have dinner overlooking the Plaza Nueva and the city's wonderful cathedral. Sevilla lies on the east bank of the Guadalquivir River, but we start our morning on the opposite side, in the beautiful barrio of Triana. Little visited by tourists, the character of this neighbourhood is totally different from its bigger sister. It is famed for its tile and pottery industry, as well as the roots of flamenco itself. We then cross the river to visit the oldest and most famous bullring in Spain, Plaza de Toros. Dating back to the 18th century, it can seat 14,000 spectators. Nearby is the Jewish quarter of Santa Cruz, a neighborhood of hole-in-the-wall bars and a bewildering rabbit warren of narrow streets. On every corner there is something that grabs the attention and piazzas appear like apparitions in the middle of a labyrinth. And then there is the Alcazar, a string of diverse palaces and gardens which reflect its layered history with styles that combine Muslim, Gothic, Renaissance, Baroque and Romantic art. One of the world's great monumental complexes is still used by the royal family today when they visit Sevilla. It transports the visitor through different eras of time. And no visit to Sevilla would be complete without seeing the incredible and overwhelming Plaza de España. Renaissance and the Amorish, this semicircle building is the size of five football pitches. We leave Sevilla for the two and a half hour drive to Granada, where we will stay for two nights. Our hotel is the beautiful and classical Alhambra Palace. It is five minutes walk from Alhambra, with splendid views overlooking the town of Granada. Meaning red in Arabic, Alhambra lies on a ridge flanked by the snow-capped mountains of Sierra Nevada. Building by the Moors started in the 13th century. After 250 years, the Christians took the fortress by cutting off the water supply. Charles V simply built his Renaissance palace further down the plateau. The result is an astonishing collision of cultures, palaces, courts, protected passageways and hidden doors. The Fountain of Lions is probably the most famous image of Alhambra. It is the centre of a very precise layout where geometry and maths have been ingeniously harnessed. While the Renaissance architecture is massive and warlike, the Islamic palaces seem light and graceful. The Alhambra is a dynastic city built over several centuries on a rocky plateau. In many ways, it is the iconic image of the Iberian Peninsula. For the final stage of the journey, we take a five hour drive to Valencia, where we stay for two nights. We then hug the Mediterranean coast for four hours until we reach Barcelona. Here we stay for three nights before flying back with Emirates to Australia. Few tourists visit Spain's third largest city because it hides conveniently behind the facades of Madrid and Barcelona. 
on the shores of the Mediterranean with a perfect year-round climate. This vibrant and thriving city is one of the most livable in the world. The city's core is more than 2,000 years old and the Bullring sits next to the Moorish North Station. In 1957, Valencia experienced a devastating flood because of the Turia River, which ran through its centre. It was decided to divert the river. The resulting dry riverbed was turned into a green ribbon that snakes through the centre of the city. This park leads to the stunning city of arts and science. Modernist architecture at its most breathtaking. Valencia is also home to the best paella in Spain and travel directors, cocineros, try their hand before we leave for Barcelona. We arrive in Barcelona at midday. Our hotel is superbly located just off Plaza Catalunya and the very famous Las Ramblas, the city's main pedestrianised walkway. Just off Las Ramblas is Barcelona's Old Town, a warren of fascinating Gothic architecture dating back 2,000 years. Passing through the Roman towers brings us to the Cathedral, a Catalan Gothic masterpiece that took 600 years to complete. Art and life merged seamlessly in Barcelona and the city's prodigal son is Antonio Gaudi. This is a block of discord where four contrasting buildings by four modernist masters vie for attention. But it's Gaudi's Casa Batlló that always steals the show. Gaudi was also a landscaper as our visit to the extraordinary Park Güell testifies. The park is full of historic and mythical symbolism, such as this forest of stone columns bending under the weight of the world. Gaudi lived in his house in the park while he worked on his greatest project of all, Sagrada Familia, which he could see in the distance. The Basilica is due for completion in 2026, which will commemorate the 100 year passing of the man they call God's architect. Sagrada Familia stuns millions of visitors a year as they gaze up into this vast visionary kaleidoscope. Barcelona has found a formidable balance, a foot in tradition and the other in avant-garde. And it is more than just a city, it is a living embodiment of dreams that can be realised. Secrets of the Iberian Peninsula unveils a wealth of hidden gems in a timeless corner of Europe. It is a journey that stretches from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean in a classic travel director's way, exploring the intricate and ancient melting pot of the Christians and the Moors.